All right. Hey, welcome here to Our City Church. I'm so glad you're here, and thank you. I want to take a second and welcome everyone who's here for the first time, or maybe you're coming back for your second or third visit. Welcome back. We are really honored that you're here. Also want to welcome everyone who's watching online on our YouTube channel or listening to our podcast. We are grateful for you. We love you. Thanks for being a part of our online campus and our online community. Uh, we just can't say enough about the reach that God continues to use our church to um, go to and to, to reach people all around the world. So we welcome all of you. A uh, special shout out to some of our soldiers. I know that that are in uh, Afghanistan. That's about all I'm going to say. It's all I'm allowed to say. Uh, and uh, I know you guys reached out recently. So thank you for your service. We love you guys so much. And we're praying for you. And um, we're believing God to keep you safe. Uh, if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to open it to John chapter 13 today. We're going to look at a couple things that Jesus said that I think will really help us in this really crucial topic. Today we're starting our brand new series uh, of talks called Relationship Goals. We want you to be able to have some goals for your relationships. And let me tell you who this message series is for. Uh, and I'm going to also tell you who it's not for. Let me first tell you who this is for. Uh, this series is for anyone in here that is in college and you one day hope that you can fall in love and stay in love and that your marriage and your relationship will be amazing and fulfilling and life-giving. That's, that's who this is for. Maybe you're single, you're out of college, but you're, you're single and you haven't met the person you're going to be with. We, we want you to be able to learn things today that will prepare you and equip you to be able to have the relationship that that is going to be also fulfilling for you. This is also for anyone who's married uh, to take a look um, at your marriage and to calibrate it, to be honest about yourself, and to be able to look into ways that you can improve so that your guys' marriage can be better. Uh, this is for those of you that are braving the world of going back into the aquarium of dating after being married before, okay? And you're going out into that wonderful ocean and you're like, oh my gosh, here we go again, okay? And if you're out there and that's you and you're single again, uh, we want to let you know that we have things to share with you today too. I, I do want to note that if you've gone through a, a, a marriage breakup and, and it, your first marriage or your second or whatever, it ended and uh, it didn't work, I want to let you know today we don't judge you, we don't look down at you, uh, and, and we welcome you and we accept you. And and we want you to be taught, hopefully, things that maybe you and I would agree that had you known those things the first time, maybe it wouldn't have gone that way. And as I do that, I hope that you will be understanding there are people in here that aren't married yet. There are people in here that are single or are just recently married or even are going through things where their first marriage can still be saved. I'm going to say some things to them, and I want when you hear them to hear them from me and from my heart, not saying anything about what you did and didn't do, but knowing that in a community, sometimes you have to let someone hear something that you, oh, kind of stings to hear for you because it's a memory of what didn't go right, but in order to be a part of a healthy community, we can't avoid saying things that are hard for you to hear just because it's hard for you because we would neglect telling people who need to hear it for the first time. Is that okay? Can you guys get with that okay? So we're going to do that throughout this series, and, and we're never harping on anyone. It's always, our city church is very warm and welcoming. I think that you've, uh, uh, accept, uh, you know, experienced that. We want you to continue continue to do so. Um, I, I, I want to tell you that um, I've always loved the topic of relationships. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by what makes them work, and, and I love it. And so this is such an uh, important series for me. I love it. Every year I look forward to preaching on relationships uh, and, and being able to share the things that I have studied, I've learned, I've learned just through my own relationships in my life, the things that have broke my heart. And I want to tell you that some of the things I'm going to talk about today, I'm talking to you because it breaks my heart that anyone doesn't experience relationship the way that God intended for them to experience. And for some of you, it breaks my heart that uh, you stay in a perpetual state of disappointment because you don't know some things that had you been taught earlier in your life or had you gotten a chance to heal from some of the things that were hurtful, you would be experiencing relationship totally different than you do today. And some of you know what I'm talking about because you've been around our city church, you've heard us talk about relationships. You've kind of heard the way we talk about relationships here. And we talk about relationships here very honestly, but differently than maybe some of the places you've been a part of before. And as you began to apply the principles you've learned here in our city, you've began to see changes. You've began to see the things we say take root and take shape and begin to, you know, sprout up and provide you more enjoyable, more purpose-filled um, relationships. That's what we want for all of you that are here today or are listening online. I, I want to tell you who this is not for. If you're a serial dater, 
You know, like for you, a, um, a good date isn't a good date unless it ends in sex. I want to tell you that this is not really going to be an enjoyable um, series for you uh, because I'm not going to highlight that. But I want to just, you know, say something to you. I, I, I don't, you know, I'm not, you're fine. You don't even feel ashamed of that. And, and you're good with it. Like you're not even embarrassed about that. You're kind of just like, hey, it's what it is. And, and, and me and you can agree or disagree on whether that's what God says and all the rest. What I want to say to you is this, is that my heart is broke for you too. And my heart is broke for you if you're in that position because uh, what you may not realize is, is that you are hurting yourself and you're hurting the other person. I know you think, well, no, it's consensual. No one gets hurt. Well, you could still do something consensually that ends in people having emotional pain. And just because it's consensual, that's a momentary decision that has lifelong effects. And anyone who is honest about themselves will say anything that you do that is, that is you know, torn apart later relationally, it hurts you. It impacts you. And, and you, you may not think that you're hurting the women or the men in your path, but you are. And you're also hurting yourself. And one day, I don't want you to have to, you know, have to be um, someone who has a hard time explaining like what happened and how you are when, when you're telling like your story. Because everything you're doing right now will eventually be a part of your story. You're going to tell someone your story. You're going to be at that point of a relationship where it's time to share what it is and what it isn't. And I don't want you to have to either lie or I don't want the things you tell to have to be so like, wow, uh, because no one ever challenged you to do better, to do different. And I want you to do better because I want you to experience something and my heart will break for you if you stay stuck in the same rules and ideas that our culture highlights, even excels at, and honestly rewards and paints a picture as if that's what really life is all about. And so I hope that you pick up for me today. I really have a heart for you. I have a heart for relationships to be life-giving and fulfilling and satisfying. Uh, and, and I I, and, I, and I love this subject, and I think that that's going to come across today in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but I, I want to let you know that if that's the place that you find yourself in, you know, I, I want you to come back, but this will be challenging for you if that's the position you find yourself in. Um, as a church, I want to do a great job of helping provide really great relationships. Um, but to do that today, I want to start off by talking about misconceptions. We have a couple of them. There's a few key misconceptions we have, and I want to talk about them. Some of you guys have ever watched the show Mythbusters. You guys ever saw it with these two guys like, who just like excelled at chemistry class, decided to make money off of it as a show? Um, brilliant. Th so they go out and they start testing things that we've all like heard. I don't know if you've ever watched the show, but um, I could give you guys some heads up. You guys might be interested to know that uh, they tested if you go to sleep and your hand is in warm water, um, it's been told that you will pee your pants in the night. I don't know if some of you know that. Uh, I'm, I was a former youth pastor, so those were things we tested all the time. <laughs> so uh, it's false. That actually is not true, just so you know. Uh, one of the other things that they tested uh, to figure out was, is it true that w if you're talking on your phone while driving that you are as dangerous of a driver as a drunk driver? That's true. And if you're texting, you're actually more dangerous. You are like a aggressive, aggressive, un, uh, over the limit driver if you're texting. So talking is as bad as drinking and driving. Texting is like you are so inebriated, you are an accident waiting to happen. So just take that into an account as you decide how it's different for you and you are different and it's, you know, you're the one that could continue to do it. Trust me. And I, and, you know, like I'm sure everybody thought that and, and, and has not maybe had that go so well. So I, I, I just want to preserve life um, and, and help you like get along. Uh, here's the other thing. Uh, they tested if women have a higher pain tolerance than men and that was tested and that was found out to be true. It is. No, they tested it. It was true. Um, and they also tested whether or not a corked bat makes baseballs fly farther. And that was false, which I'm sure Sammy Sosa wish he knew years ago because <laughs> he, he got caught. Um, look, I want to bust some of the relationship myths that we have also because some of you have some relationship misconceptions or ideas and you are holding on to them. And, and whether you know this or not, um, your entire idea about relationships have been being formed uh, in you and around you for your entire life. And you didn't even know it was happening. And all of a sudden you grow up and you have an idea about what it means. Um, and it was formed uh, in a lot of different ways. And some of us, it was in fairy tales, okay? And in the fairy tale story, it kind of goes like this. Your life is dif difficult. Um, you have a challenging adventure. And then when you get married, all of a sudden, like all of your challenges, like go away and you live happily ever after 
right? Um, magazines will help us with this idea. They focus on the super sexy celebrity couple, and we can't get enough of like whoever they are, the hottest item of, of, of the year or the, the season, and we highlight them because they're good looking. They found each other. It must mean that their relationship is going awesome, that they have a great relationship. Um, TV shows, I don't want to name them, but you know their names, and some of you have parties that you watch them together. <laughs> Whatever. And I'm not here to, you know, whatever, do your thing. I'm just saying it highlights a cultural idea of what makes a relationship, which is the better looking the people, the more it looks good on the outside, that means the substance is good on the inside. They'll live happily ever after if they just find true love, right? That, that's what it is. Oh, I just got to find somebody, I got to fall in love. We have movies that do this, right? And the entire movie industry uh, tells us this overpowering view of relationships, but I want to tell you this, is that a lot of you have that view of relationships, and your overarching, overpowering view of marriage is a fantasy world. You do. You have a fantasy world idea of marriage, and as a result of that, our relationships don't look like we imagined they would, and we get disappointed, and we take it out on our marriage partner. Gosh, it got quiet in here. This is what happens when you are in an idea of, 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 a, of a relationship and then you get into what real relationship is and the narrative you told yourself is so different than what was really real. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, and, and here's what's hard is being honest and real is, is scary and no one really does it. And, and so all of a sudden it's like, wow, m our marriage must be so much worse than everybody else's. Our relationship is so much worse. It's like it actually might just be like normal but you don't know that because you're comparing your normal to fantasy. And anytime you compare your normal to fantasy, you'll be disappointed and you'll make rash decisions. You'll have rash behaviors. You'll lash out because you're disappointed in your fantasy world that's not coming true. When really it was never going to come true. It was never really the goal and God didn't want it to be that way. That's not what he set up. So some of the, um, the, the, the ideas I want you to understand is this though. Here's what I believe. That no matter how dysfunctional, uh, your past is, regardless of how many times that you have been married or heartbroken, uh, and regardless of what stories or statistics that I could share with you, this is what I do believe, is that it is possible to have a healthy, long-term relationship with another human being, okay? I believe that. But to get there, we have to be able to deconstruct some of the things that we believe. So here's one of them. You might have heard me say this before in, in my life or online or something, but it's, it's key. It's critical. Some of you are new to our city, so I want to make sure we always are up to speed on all this. First one is this. Relationship myths, number one, is the first step to a healthy relationship is finding the right person. That the first step to a healthy relationship is if you find the right person, you will be happy. Then you'll be fulfilled. The starting point for living happily ever after is making sure you find the right girl or guy. And the idea is this. Here's the implication of that. Is if they were better, I'd be happy. If they acted better, if they would just change, I would be happier if they would just be better. And that's what the right person myth tells us. If they were better, I'd be happy because they're not better. I can't be happy and I'm not happy and it's their fault I'm not happy. And the reality of this is that it, it, it is not true. Here's the real truth. Here's the real truth. Um, the first step to a healthy relationship is becoming the right person. That's the first step. First, very first step is becoming the right person. If you will in turn change the idea of, I am waiting to find, if I find Mr. Right, if I find Mrs. Right, then, then I'll be happy. And you change that and you go, if I focus more of my efforts and energy not on trying to control and make this person become what I want them to be or hope I find this person built into who I want them to be, but I begin to spend all of that energy, which is wasted energy, by the way, because it doesn't work, and you actually start to apply that energy to becoming the right person. Then you will begin to experience what God has intended for you in relationship. So what does that look like? Well, focusing on your character. What's your character? Your character is how you act when no one's watching. Your character is how you treat your partner when no one will find out about it. That's your character. How do you treat her when you know no one else will know what you said and did in that moment? That's your character. Working on your responses, rooting out why you respond like that, getting to work, 
doing the things you have to do to say, okay, it's work. I got to go underneath the soil that's underneath the soil of what's rotting this garden I have up here. I can't grow fruit that lasts, and I don't know why. I got to go underneath the surface. I can't keep blaming the person sitting underneath the tree of my life, my partner, and being like, you, you, you. It's like, whoa, let me, what's underneath the soil here that's causing this disrupt? So the myth is got to be changed, and, and, and it's got to focus. And I would tell you this, that these are my values, and, and you don't have to have these, but I, I'm a person of faith. I'm a believer in Jesus and of, of, of God's way. I think that one of the things that you'll need to do is you have to revisit your relationship with Jesus is that your relationship with Jesus is the main source of what will help you change into the right person. You, in fact, I would go on the record and say this. I actually don't believe you can become the right person that you really uh, will be fulfilled in a relationship by becoming unless Jesus is a primary, the primary relationship in your life. I, I don't believe it's possible. And I tried. I've tried it all, friends. And if I ain't tried it, my friends have tried it. And I got some crazy friends. Some are in this room. <laughs> and listen, I'm telling you, I would tell you that you're fooling yourself if you think you can go find a way outside of Jesus to become the right person. You won't. You, you won't be able to do it. Jesus can change you. He wants to change you, but you have to be willing to say, God, I, I need you. I need you to help me change, or I'm going to stay in this same space. Myth number two is that marriage changes people. Marriage changes people. If we get married, we'll be happier because, you know, everything's cool then. We'll be together. We'll live together. If you grew up Christian and you waited to get married the way that we teach, we believe God uh, set us up for and, and, and created sex to be um, beautiful and amazing and powerful and connecting, but he also created it to be within the concept of marriage. That's what the Bible teaches. We believe that. We believe that sex is like the ocean. Uh, it's beautiful. It's amazing. It's powerful, but it has a shore and it should stop. And it should be limited to where it is that God said. And anytime the ocean goes past the ocean shore that God created for it, it causes destruction. And anytime you take sex beyond what God created it for, it's going to cause destruction. We believe that. We believe that God can be trusted to come up with sex, which I think, yay God. And then if he's smart enough to come up with sex, he's probably smart enough to come up with where it ought to take place. That's just the way we think. I don't know. That's a little too like brilliant um like you know like but like I just think yeah it's like it just makes sense and so we believe that but I want to tell you that sometimes we think like oh if we just if we just added that part of it to the relationship then the relationship will get better marriage is going to fix it the reality is um once we're married all the annoying little things do not go away they get highlighted so those little, I want to tell you something that my pastor told me. He goes, take everything that Brenda does that annoys you, okay, before you get married, and times it by at least 10, and if you still want to marry her, marry her. And if you don't, don't. Don't ruin that woman's life by being mad at her for who she is for the rest of her life. Don't do that. Don't torment someone by, like, loving them and, and being, ah, oh, that's not so bad. I could change him. I'll change him. I'll, those will go away. No, they won't. They're going to stay, and then you'll be mad at him for being who he is. You'll be mad at her for the rest of her life. They're paying for being someone who just, their teeth. <laughs> and now they can't have a good weekend because you can't deal with your emotions over there fixing their teeth? Don't do that to them. That's mean. Just let them go. Suck their teeth with somebody else. Here's the truth about marriage. Marriage reveals what's in people. I've met a lot of couples. I've I never heard anybody say, you know, it's, this is, what, I mean this. I've met with a lot of couples, but here's what I've never heard. I've never heard anyone come in and say, I just want to let you know right off the bat, I'm the problem. Isn't that weird? Everybody knows there's problems in their marriage, but I've never heard a married person come in and say, hey, before we get started, Pastor Chris, I just want to let you know, I'm, it's me. I'm the fault. I'm the reason this isn't going well. It's never that. It's always like, well, I got this whole list of stuff for them. And then it's like, if I ask them for a percentage of the pie, here's one whole pie. How much of this pie is your fault? And they'll cut out like the smallest piece of sliver. Like, oh, probably that, right, that, there you go. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, it, it's never equal. 
And this is because we believe a myth that we're going to be happy, they're going to make us happy. And then when you get in there, you recognize that what's in people's coming out. Uh, and I always tell people this, dude, you're going to figure this out. When you get married, you're going to find out who they really are. Why? Because now they know you're not leaving. <laughs> Yeah, married people are laughing right now because they know that junk's true. <laughs> if you're single, you're thinking, oh, okay, why well, can't deal with that? Because that's not that bad. That's not all there is either. There's more to that bad. And once you throw away the key and you're like, I'm with you forever. Once both of you, I don't know why it is. It's, a, it's, like a, it's like you don't even know you're doing it. But once the man and the woman know you ain't leaving me, oh, that means all the crazy can come out right now. <laughs> And then it does. It comes out. I tell all my couples who I do their weddings or marriage, I'm like, hey, just know, you might get a little sideways on your honeymoon. Okay, it might just happen. You just might. You, that first couple months, it's like you're figuring so much out in that space. We normalize it at our city church because we don't want to live under these myths that you then get disappointed if when you get into reality. And part of it is just because nobody ever told you the truth. Um, the, the, here's, here's what I, I, I believe is important for you to recognize, is that your heart is important to guard. Proverbs said it like this, Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Let me tell you this, uh, you're not going to be a healthy partner for someone if you're still angry at people who have hurt you. You're not, you are not going to, listen to me, listen, listen, you will not be a good partner for someone if you are still super angry at the people who have hurt you before. Okay, number one. Number two, if you don't believe that there is someone good for you, and you believe no one will ever love you, you will also not be a very good partner because you will be way too needy and way too desperate and you will cling on and put up with behavior that is terrible and dysfunctional just because you need somebody to be somebody. And that is also not a guarding of your heart. You need to guard your heart from the lies that nobody wants to be with you because that's not true. That's the voice of the enemy trying to defeat you. There are lots of people who would love to be with someone who is you at your best right self. But you at this lie believing, feel sorry for myself, poor woes me, and I don't know why it's taken this long, or I don't know why, and I don't know. That is, no one has ever fallen in love with someone like that. And you have to correct that thinking and you have to change your heart. Guard your heart. Do not let that stuff get in your heart. You might think it's, oh, it's not as bad as being angry. It's just as bad as being angry because it's just as much of a turnoff and it's just as dysfunctional. Because someone comes in and they meet someone and it's like, you just cling. And someone's like, whoa, uh, why are you so needy? Why are you so clingy? And what's behind all that? And a healthy person will snuff that out and you won't end up. You lower the pond that you can fish out of when you're like that. And I want to encourage you today. Listen, I get it. I went through my entire 20s in ministry with a large youth ministry, single. Okay, I get the whole single being single for a long time thing. I do, I get it. And I went through all the ups and downs and eventually was fine with it and I got cool with it. But I wasn't always cool with it. It was difficult. And I'm gonna tell you this, when you're in ministry, it's worse because everywhere you go, everybody's married and everybody wants to set you up with their granddaughter and their niece and, you know, sweetheart Sally and she's neither sweet. I don't wanna say the rest of that joke, but I wanna say, <laughs> I used to say it, but I've matured and grown as a man. Um, but I, uh, but I have a few of you in the crowd who are like, can I know the rest of that joke after service? And I just want to tell you, you're, you're sick, okay? <laughs> but here, here, listen, listen, listen. I get it and I understand it, but I want to tell you that the healthiest version of yourself is believing about yourself that God has someone for you. Guard your heart from believing the lie that no one ever, it will never happen. Because I'm telling you right now, it will. The other thing I want to say is guard, listen, guard your heart. Guard your heart from believing the lie that there is a person on this planet who will make you happy and fulfilled. Because that ain't true. There is no someone who's going to complete you. That whole Jerry Maguire movie thing, it's crap. Okay, it's not like you complete me. You had me at hello. Yeah, right. Not true. No one completes you. Healthy marriage is not when someone who's broken finds someone else who's broken in the opposite ways and they fit like a puzzle. That's just two broken people taking their broken hearts out on each other for the rest of their lives. That ain't health. Let me tell you what health is. Two whole people who find wholeness in Jesus and then celebrate the wholeness in each other and help each other with the brokenness of their humanity. 
but they don't have so much brokenness that they find the brokenness in you as a reason to feel a little bit better about mine, and I'm just going to be there to point out yours because yours scares me. See, if someone else's brokenness constantly frightens you and scares you, you'll just attack them all the time because you're always afraid. But that's not healthy. That's never going to do it. And it goes against what Jesus told us that he wanted us to be, act, and do when it comes to these myths. There's a few other ones, but I don't want to tell them to you. I don't know, because you're not, are, are you going to do these things? <laughs> All right, I'll tell you. No. Here's one of them you say, the grass is greener on the other side. You asked, I'm going to do, because you just said you want to know. And I'm going to say, what I gave you a chance to opt out, but I'm now going to say it. And it's not my fault, it's yours. And here it is. Stop thinking of the person that you didn't choose that you dated in high school or college as an evaluation against the person you now have. Stop going into Facebook. You have no business being friends with your ex-girlfriend. You have no business being friends with your ex-boyfriend. What good will come of remembering your times together? You should never bring up how good the love was between you and her. If you are a guy and you ever bring up how good the love was between you and your former, you're stupid. <laughs> if you bring up your ex-boyfriend to your man ever, you, I know I'm not allowed to say what I said to them. It's so just culturally different. No. You are what the Proverbs in the Bible calls a foolish woman. A woman without wisdom. If you were a man, I would say you were stupid, but you're not, so I'll just say you're foolish. It's foolish to bring up. So listen, the grass ain't greener. To quote the wonderful American poet Justin Bieber, the grass is greener where you water it. That's where it is. It's greener where you water it. He didn't originate that. He put it in a song. Some of you are like confounded right now. You're like, you're going up to like easylyrics.com. I'm like, stop, come back, come back. I like lost my audience just now. I'm like, wow. Jeez. It's important for you to be able to recognize uh, this idea that if you had some secret vacation on a remote island and you got back together, that you would be able to cultivate the emotions you're really looking for. Can I tell you what you're addicted to in that? It's called adrenaline. Now, if you're not a brain scientist, you don't know what I'm about to tell you, but I'm about to tell you something that will help you hopefully understand why you get yourself into those problems. Adrenaline is the excitement chemical that is released into your bloodstream that makes you feel extreme joy and happiness or extreme strength. And it gets released when something either really tragic bad happens or something super exciting awesome. It's also a cocktail because it has serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins that release. So you have all these chemicals happening. Some of you feel that at a game-winning shot. Some of you feel it at the end of your favorite movie or, or when puppies play together. I don't know what it does for you. <laughs> it's different for all of us, okay? But you feel it and it's like, whoa! And we chase that and want that and desire that. Some of us as parents unintentionally create adrenaline passions in our kids because we shame them for things that should just be talked about openly. Don't touch that. We don't do that. Now there's adrenaline. Whoa, adrenaline got into the bloodstream about something that they were discovering naturally about their body. And now there's this weird physical, chemical, emotional experience. And they grow up and they act out and they don't know what to do because they have adrenaline they're chasing. Okay. They put their hand in the cookie jar and you overreact. Now, huh, I don't even know why I want to get into trouble. I don't really want to get into trouble. I just get into trouble because they have this adrenaline power that comes in them and they're hungry for it, okay? Side note, but here's what you need to recognize. Some of you are addicted to the adrenaline that comes in the love components of a relationship. 
And you tell yourself, if you were with the person you remember some of that from, you'd be happy. But what you don't know is you don't really want to be with them. You want to be with the emotion you felt when something was new and mysterious to you. But once it's not new and mysterious and it's actually work, it's no longer fun. It's exciting to buy the farm. It's hard to actually make the farm produce a harvest. Some of you are the kind of people that just want to buy farms but you don't, wanna, you don't wanna actually learn what it takes to produce it, to create work, to do it. You love the idea of new and exciting, new and exciting. Can I tell you a little secret about new and exciting? New and exciting releases adrenaline only while it's new and exciting. Once it's not new, then it's not exciting, then there's no adrenaline, then you have to work at it. And some of you get stuck hating the relationship you're in, projecting onto the person there's something wrong with them because you have not matured and grown up enough to understand the myth is, no, 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 water it. Don't expect it to stay green all the time. And new and mysterious doesn't stay new and mysterious. You have to keep new. You have to keep mysterious. This is an important concept when it comes to our relationships. And the last one is I just hit a little bit, which is love is a lot of work. No, it's not. Love is easy. Love is super easy. Falling in love requires one thing, a pulse. Anybody can fall in love. Love is not hard. People think love. Love is not hard. Let me tell you what is hard. Um, or the truth about love, rather, is staying in love is a lot of work. Falling in love, easy. Staying in love, difficult. So with my remaining time, I want you to see how to make it happen. And Jesus is very clear. At the end of his life, he sits down with all of his disciples, and if you're new to the Bible, he had 12 of them. He gets them around. He's getting ready to die on the cross. He does something similar, if you are a Bible reader, to what Moses does in the Old Testament. If you're someone who wants to read a little extra this week, you can write these in your notes. In Deuteronomy chapter 31 through 33 is Moses' farewell address. Go read that over and compare it to Jesus' farewell address, which is found in John 13 through 17. Those four chapters, those three chapters in Deuteronomy for Moses. What you'll find here is that these farewell speeches are very similar. And I got to say, it seems a little unfair to guys what is about to be said by Jesus. Because it seems like what Jesus is about to say is a little easier for caring, naturally nurturing uh, creatures as women versus men just being a little more stoic or not so loving, caring, nurturing uh, as easy. But I want to tell you that what Jesus says is, is important for all of us. And it's just as much of a commandment. And what he ultimately tells us is this. I want to give you a new command. He says it this way. A new command I give you. And he says this. Love one another. Now, that's not new. Love one another is not new. Everybody knew that you're supposed to love one another. But then Jesus adds this to it. And this is the new commandment. Love one another. Ready? As I have loved you. Now, that's new. Now, what's new about it? He says, so you must love one another. So love, not new. Love one another, not new. Love one another the way I have loved you, brand spanking, brand new, hot off the press. Now the disciples are silent going, "Uh, what? Here's the guy talking about he's going to die. He's going to give up his life. He's, you know, all this stuff. What, What does he mean? He goes on in verse 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my And actually, the real Greek in here would be my real disciples. Not in label, but in actuality. If you love one another. So it's not new, but the as I loved you part is so crucial. Because I I, I bet, I don't know if you're like me, but if you're like me, you might be thinking the same thing. I was thinking it was like, wait, wait, he wants me to love people like him? Hold on, time out, Jesus. A little unfair you can't ask me to pole vault like, like over like 19 stories because I can't do it. You know why? Because I'm not God. It's a little unfair, don't you think, for him to say, you got to love people the way I loved you. Oh, I'm God. Good luck. Keep up. It's a little, I don't know, it's just a little overwhelming to be required to love somebody the way Jesus did, and I ain't Jesus. I didn't always exist. I didn't have a relationship with the Father, like connected because we are one. I don't have any of that working for me. I've got a lot working against me, and I've got the same requirement on me that Jesus had for himself, and he's God. Don't you see the absolute unfairness of this? It seems unfair. But actually, what I want to point out to you is that that's kind of the point. The point is that you have no chance of doing it. 
You have no chance of doing it on your own. You need Jesus to do it. That's the point of the statement. Love one another as I have loved you. I can't do that. You're right. You need me to love like I love. Or else you'll love like you were loved and the way you were loved was incomplete and broken at times. Anyone honest enough with themselves to say that? Is there anyone honest enough with themselves to say, I was loved in some broken ways. There were some things I needed, some resources emotionally I needed, I did not get. And as a result of that, I love incompletely. I don't, I don't love complete. I, I was loved incomplete and I now love incomplete. And what Jesus is saying to you today is, I, I am complete in my love. And if you will come and know me and let me into those parts of your heart, I will heal, I will repair, I will strengthen you, I will help you if you do the things I've asked you to do. And then he says, if you'll do that, then you can, in fact, love as I have loved. But the only way to love like Jesus loves is to let yourself be loved by Jesus. Jesus, how do I let you love me? What does that look like? How can I actually let you love me? Well, I, I want you to basically do what Jesus says. He makes love a verb, not a feeling. And love other people the way I've loved you. So you have to do as Jesus did, love each other. Here's, I've been saying this, God put this in my spirit a couple months ago, I've been saying this, I sp spoke at a big youth conference up in Seattle, and I told every one of these students this thing, and I made them chant it. If you want to be different, you have to do different. If you want to be different, it's not coming up, it's not in the notes, it's in my heart. If you want to be different, you have to do different. If you want to love like Jesus loved, you have to let Jesus love you. You have to let Jesus love you. You have to invite him into your daily. Invite him into your morning. Invite him into your commute. Invite him into your workout. Invite him into the meals that you prep. Invite him into the meetings you're about to go lead. Invite him into the time you're gonna sit on the plane. Invite him in to the spaces and the conversations. Invite him in. Invite his ways. What are his ways? It's his character. It's the things he sanctions. It's the things that he was and the things he sanctions for you to do. So it's, you got it wrong, you own it and apologize. Why? Because that's what Jesus would want you to do. It's learning how to use your words to praise and encourage the people around you. That's doing his love. It's serving those who, by all intents and purposes, should be serving you. He washed his disciples' feet before he goes to the cross. Jesus is someone that you then go study. For some of you, I invite you into this. I would invite you into taking seriously reading the Bible stories about Jesus for the next couple months up to Easter. That you just decide, you know what, I don't know enough about the way Jesus was. I want to read everything I can get. Everything. And I would tell you, go start. Go start right away. Go read John and then go read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Go read all the Gospels and just digest everything you can about Jesus. Why? Because you'll get a chance to go, oh my gosh, that way of being, his character is so different than my character. When he gets squeezed emotionally, he responds differently than, than I do. He's got boundaries, but he's not ugly about them. And all of a sudden, you start to recognize more of his character in you when you make space for him. How else can you do this? Well, I want to tell you something. That Christianity is intensely practical. And so I want to challenge you again to make love a verb, not a noun. Take some action, bust your myths, bust the things, the narratives you've been telling yourself, and build a relationship on the foundation of Christ because we know that staying in love is a lot of work. So specifically, how can you do this specifically for you? Well, I'll take a brief detour and I'm going to come back for us all. I want to say, you need to do, listen, you have to, you will not bust any of your narratives, any of your myths in isolation. Listen, in isolation, you get to stay right all the time about everything you think. 
Nobody can challenge your thoughts. Nobody could share, ah, I don't know about that one. Well, is that really the way that you came across to her? Is that really what he did? Do you think that that's why? Maybe he was late. Maybe she didn't. Maybe, and you get in community, your presuppositions, your internal dialogue, your internal narrative of how that person was unfair, not right, didn't care, doesn't this. And what about all that in isolation stays empowered, stays on the throne, stays right, and can rule the kingdom of your version of relationships. But once you step into community and you invite mentors, friends, other people, and you share some of that, and then you get feedback, now you get to actually test if your narrative is accurate, and you get to hear feedback and go, oh, I'm off on that. Don't stay in isolation. That's why at uh, at our city, we are all about two major things. We believe everyone who's a part of our all-in team, we want them serving. We want them serving. And I got to tell you, if you've been here for a couple months, like by now, or you're just even new, I would encourage you to get into a serve team today. Why? Because when you serve together, you talk, you share, you pray in the morning, every Sunday. And, And Speaking of myths, some of you have a church myth. You know what your church myth is? You think this church just happens on Sundays. You show up and it's just here. Do you know that there's people every single Sunday here at 5.30 in the morning and they don't leave till 2? And you know they work the same Monday to Friday job that you do and sit on the 91 both ways? And they show up at 5.30 every single week on their half day off. They take a whole half of their day off. They get one full day on Saturday and only the back end of it on Sunday. And that's if they don't go to an all-in meeting like we have today at 2 p.m. That was a sly announcement invitation. (laughs) They set up, there's people that are on a rotation, that greet, watch our children, help do everything that we do. And I want to ask you, if you're not serving, I want to ask you to address your church myth. Find a place to serve. Find a place to help us welcome people, to connect people, to watch and care for our kids, to be able to be a part of our, our worship team. If you, if you love to sing, if, man, people have told you you sing amazing, we want you to sing with us. If you love an instrument, we would love you to be a part. If you love media, we'd love you to be a part of it. It's important for us to have people helping us do this because, honestly, without your help, we've got smaller groups of people doing way too much work as we continue to grow. So I want to ask you, get into community by serving and find a place to serve here in our church. You could sign up today, literally use that connection card, be like, I want to serve, I want to give back. But it's not just we want your help. I don't want anything from you. I'm going to say that a lot. You're going to hear that for the rest of the time I'm pastoring this church. I don't want anything from you. I don't want your money and I don't want your service. I want something for you. I want you to experience what it's like when you start tithing. I want you to experience what it's like when you give to Kingdom Builders. I want you to experience what it's like to serve on a team and all of a sudden you have friends that are being honest and sharing insights with you and you no longer are in isolation, bound by these crazy ideas and thoughts and hurts and pains, but people pray with you and help pull the rocks and the crags out of the hurtful parts of the wound in your heart and begin to help heal it and care for it and you change and become like Christ. I want that for you. And you can't get that in isolation. You can't get that just attending. You get that in community. Uh, I, I would say that the, the other practical thing, and our starts tonight is this, is that if you're not in a life group, I implore you, please, get into a life group. It is a practical way. And we've got them for everybody. No matter if you're in college, single, if you are married, if you're young married, young kids, like we got them for everybody, okay? And our starts tonight, Brent and I are in a life group. We keep it 100. People that are in this room that are in our life group, you already know. You know more about us than we probably ever want anyone else to know. But, like, we believe in life groups. Why? Because... All of the myths that you're walking around with, they have no chance in healthy community because you'll have people who will walk with you and challenge you and share with you and share their own. Sometimes the way that you'll find out you're holding on to a myth, watch this, is you'll hear someone else say the same myth that you have, only when you're listening to them say it, you're like, you sound so crazy. but I think the same thing, I'm crazy. It's like that's how you become illuminated. God uses these wonderful, beautiful, amazing relational ways to help us mature and grow and become more like him week after week. So today, on your way out, we have life group signups. You can go out out there and sign up, please. Do not stay on your own. Don't try to do this thing. It was not meant for us to do it alone. Uh, I wanna pray for you today. Because I really do believe that, um, that uh, the next couple weeks can change the history of your lives. I don't know where your marriage is. Let me speak to the married people. Some of your marriages need the next couple weeks. 
okay? Because some of you are on the rocks, or some of you are just rocky, okay? It's not on the rocks. Your commitment is strong. Your love is secure. That's not the problem. You're not looking to get out of it, but it's just such a rocky ride, more than it needs to be. And I want to help us pave with, with God's help. Like, how can we pave a better road so the experience is better? And, and so I really want that for you for the next couple weeks, and, and I want to pray for you today. I want to also pray for some of you who are in the season of waiting. Uh, I call it the in-between time. You're in between what you have and what you wish you had. And I want to pray with you about how can you. We're going to talk about this in the next couple of weeks. How do you make the most? How do you become the right person? How can you really, really, really get to work on that stuff so that you become such an attractive, not person on the outside, but you learn how to attract what you're looking for? Because here's the secret. We're going to talk about this in the next couple of weeks is this. You attract what you advertise. And I want to help you learn how to advertise what you want to attract. Because this is the deal. If you are looking for somebody that you're not looking to become like, that's not fair. And the question I'd ask you is, are you, the per- are you becoming the person that the person you're looking for is looking for? Because if you're not working on becoming the person that the person you're looking for is looking for, it's not fair and it's not going to happen. And honestly, you're just prolonging the inevitable. It's, it's going to just be a longer time because you're just like, well, I'm hoping they're looking for me. Are you becoming who they're looking for? No, but I hope that they just look past all that and fall in love with me. Well, that's self-absorbed. I would maybe even say selfish and naive, and I'd probably add to it immature if I was being honest with you, which I am. And listen, I don't want that for you because it's heartbreaking and it's sad and it's an unnecessary loneliness when you don't have to stay like that, but you do have to correct your thinking. So I want to pray for these things. So I'm going to invite you, if you would, just for privacy, would you bow your head and close your eyes for just a second? And if you're in here today and you would just say, you know what, Pastor Chris, man, I needed today's message. Our marriage needs it. I need God to help me not look at the other not keep blaming like him or her, but I need to become more of the right person. I I need to be the person that they thought they were gonna marry, not maybe who they ended up marrying. Because your spouse believed something about you and they married you because of it. How could you become more of what they thought and hoped you'd be? Let's focus on that, not what they are a disappointment for, but let's say, God, help me look at that. And if you're single today, how can you, become the right person? How can you invite Jesus closer to you, his ways closer to you? How can you stop believing the lie that nobody is out there for you? But to once again, dare to have hope, dare to believe again, because I'm gonna tell you, the distance between you being available for somebody who you would actually wanna be with might be the journey into the scary place of believing again, because it's easier to not believe. It's easier to just say, no one would ever want me, because you don't get hurt, you don't get let down, you don't get disappointed, you don't have to worry about it. When you don't get asked out, it doesn't hurt, because you stopped expecting to be asked out. But those are the things that break our hearts, and those are the things that make us hard to be able to be connected with and God wants us to change from that he'll protect and guard your heart but you do have to entrust it to his hands so God I come before you with our church and with our guests and our friends listening online and I know this subject is so big it's a heavy one and I just speak right now your love I just speak your love right now into the hearts of everyone under the sound of my voice. I pray, God, it would go into places we didn't even know we needed it. God, would it go into places that stopped believing and provide hope and health and safety and security that we don't have to be afraid and we don't have to guard and protect um, ourselves from everything. If we allow your wisdom to guard us, we will be guarded. Your wisdom is what guards our heart. Your wisdom is what protects us. We don't have to attack to protect. We can trust you to do it if we follow your wisdom. Help us to learn those ways more. Jesus, for those of us that are in relationship today and it's more rocky than it needs to be, or for some of us, it's literally on the rocks. God, would you help us not get so focused, over-focused on the narrative we've got in our head about what we don't like about the person, but God, would we go into your heart and say, help me to become the person they thought they were gonna marry. Help me to become the person they fell in love with. Help me to be more like him more like her, so that I could give the right person away and not just keep being mad that they didn't end up being the right person. And if we'll do that, two people will get more of the right person 
and this road won't be so rocky. Jesus, I pray and speak those things out in your spirit, into our hearts, into our minds. And now I bless our church today, God. I bless them with your blessing for this week. I ask that, God, you would rain upon them in their hearts your love. May the love of Jesus be present, be felt, be uh, strong. May it be experienced on a level, God, that we have not even known we needed. And as we begin to drink of the love of Jesus, may we recognize we are more thirsty for it than we knew. May it satisfy the things that we have ignored. And God, may we press into you. I pray we would listen to more worship songs driving this week. I pray, God, we would walk and, and run and work out in the gym to songs about you, that we would connect with you. God, I pray that some of us would find our place in serving so that community will ev erode the isolation where we just stay bound in these ideas about ourselves, bound in ideas about our partner. And God, I pray that in community, those things would come out and be fleshed out into a healthy truth instead of being bound by the myths. God, do that in our life groups as well so that we could grow as a healthy church. I bless our church and I pray over our relationships in your mighty name, Jesus. And if you believe that, receive that. Would you say amen?